are back. Would you welcome, please, Joseph Newman. Nice to meet you. I appreciate you having me. Do you think your machine, if it can be commercially made available, can, for example, a person would buy a three or four hundred pound unit and all of a sudden would be able to produce all of the energy they need for their home? Is that certainly within the realm of possibility? Exactly. I have absolutely no doubt about it. That uh, such a device hooked to a home, a person will never have to pay for energy again. The device will be made uh, smaller as to put in an automobile, plane, spacecraft, you name it. This device... Using the atoms from the, from the magnetic field and what you're doing is that you're converting mass into energy on a 100% conversion process. That's one of the first prototypes, and it, uh, that's a 700-pound magnetic rotor, and it's got uh, about 8,000 pounds of wire around it. Now, it's gone down. That unit there weighs 135 pounds, and I showed that at the Hilton in uh, New Orleans. There was approximately uh, 2,500 people attended, 1,000 people outside, and another 1,200, 1,500 standing to get in. And uh, it would demonstrate something like 25 times more out than externally and put it into the system. You get more wattage out of that than... Than what you'd, what, you'd put, than what you'd put in. In fact, a railback battery company is working with me now trying to design a battery to hold up to this recharging effect of this system. Because not only will it run the device, it'll put more energy back into the battery pack and came out of it. So you could... That's, that, that's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> tell you what, if we could stay here all night... Did you know that in May 1986... U.S. Representative Bob Livingston of Louisiana and chairman of the Republican Study Committee wrote a five-page stinging report of the power brokers and their fight against Joseph Newman's fight for humanity. The report concluded, Joseph Newman has received arbitrary and unfair treatment at the hands of the PTO and Judge Jackson. Congress should act because the executive and judicial branches have failed this American citizen. In light of Congress's oversight responsibilities and the fact that it is empowered by the Constitution to issue patents, and the fact that the preponderance of evidence is in Newman's favor, and the fact that this invention is potentially beneficial to hundreds of millions of people, it is totally in order for Congress to grant Newman a patent and to allow the American marketplace to decide the value of this invention. On March 10, 1987, Congressman Robert W. Kastenmeier, chairman of the Subcommittee on Court, Civil Liberties, and the Administration of Justice stated, this is the greatest conspiracy against any human being in the history of the world concerning Joseph Newman's fight for humanity. In 1968, God had me go through a series of thoughts, and I saw it. It's a gyroscopic particle, and I knew that it was right, and I knew it could be beneficial to mankind. Gyroscopes, like this child's toy, stabilize as they spin on their axis. In examining the way magnets attract and repel, Joe came up with nothing less than a working model for the universe that turned scientific theory of the last 200 years on its ear. He believes all atomic particles are actually tiny gyroscopes. Always staying level, they move in endless spirals, attracting and colliding with each other. And it's that theory that drives his machine. I think it's probably the most significant discovery in the history of man. Still, the U.S. Patent Office calls Newman's invention an impossible perpetual motion machine, and for eight years now has refused to grant him a patent. If I'm wrong, the best way to have exposed me, issued the patent, throw me out in the public, and if I was wrong, they'd prove I was wrong right quick. Nobody would be embarrassed but Joe Newman. Today, Joe Newman was not embarrassed. He brought his slow-moving car to a stop after two hours and said it could have gone on and on. Newman compared it to the first flight of the Wright brothers. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Biloxi, Mississippi. And for your can-do CBS Evening News, Dan Rather. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Seldom has any story we've covered sparked more reaction than the strange saga of Joseph Newman. Mr. Newman is a Mississippi inventor who makes some strange claims concerning an energy machine he invented. The public and scientific communities have been amused, angered, and at the same time very interested. Garland Robinette has followed this story for more than a year now. The latest twist took him to our nation's capital. The controversy began as soon as Joseph Newman introduced this strange-looking device to an energy-hungry public. 
He claimed that this electromagnetic machine operates without the use of any conventional fuels. He claimed the machine produces more energy out than is externally put in. Now pick an expert in the field and they'll tell you that's impossible. But Mr. Newman claims he is achieving this by an internal conversion of matter into energy. And now 31 people with scientific backgrounds have signed legal documents swearing to the machine's validity. But the most important endorsement came this week from a most unlikely source. Mr. Newman has been fighting for a patent for years. Many, therefore, considered it ironic when a federal judge appointed the former head of the patent office, William Schuyler, to decide if Newman's device did or did not work. Mr. Schuyler, who is also considered to be an expert on electrical engineering, didn't take long to make his decision. In a report of the special master, Mr. Schuyler states, Evidence before the court is overwhelming that Newman has built and tested a prototype of his invention in which the output energy exceeds the external input energy. Therefore, there is no contradictory factual evidence. For the layman, that means the machine works. The expert then goes on to say, the patent office finding that such a machine is impossible is clearly erroneous. Mr. Schuyler also found that the patent office intentionally did not consider the formalities of Mr. Newman's application for a patent. Why wouldn't you go along, again, with a master that's former head of the, the uh, patent office, who has credentials that the uh, judge called outstanding, why wouldn't you go along with the man that you recommended in granting a patent? You ask mean questions, don't you? I think you'd have to address that question to our present commissioner. Are you acting on his orders? You might say that, yes. In this case, there's only one word for it so far, and that's outrageous. Long ago, the patent office should have issued a patent. But since then, a number of incidents have occurred that makes it entirely possible that Mr. Newman has discovered a new form of energy that could have a tremendous impact on all of our lives. The first of those incidents occurred in March of this year when engineers from Mississippi State University arrived in Loosedale, Mississippi to test Mr. Newman's device. Representatives of the State Department of Energy were also on hand to observe the testing. For six days, tests were run. Some of the tests were simple, some of the results perplexing. WWL engineers conducted one of the tests done by Mississippi State. Eight slightly used pin light batteries in series were placed on a motor that was doing virtually no work. That's it. The batteries died in one minute and 15 seconds. Those dead dry cell batteries that are not supposed to recharge were then linked to a portable model of Mr. Newman's invention. The batteries turned a 90 pound magnet for one hour and 15 minutes. Then, because of a lack of time on our part, we removed the batteries. We then reattached the batteries to the original motor. The motor ran two minutes and 28 seconds before the batteries died. That is twice as long as the first time on batteries that are not supposed to recharge. Almost any engineer or physicist will tell you that those test results should be impossible. But after six days of test, the senior engineer doing the testing for Mississippi State said Mr. Newman's machine did produce more energy out than in. That too is supposed to be impossible. On August 18th of this year, Joseph Newman was invited to the NASA facility near Picayune, Mississippi. Over 70 scientists and engineers wanted to hear Mr. Newman's theory. At the time, WWL was slated to tape that meeting. But the night before the meeting, we were called and asked not to come. It seems the scientists and engineers felt they would be restricted in their questioning of Mr. Newman if television cameras were present. So we agreed to stay away. For Joseph Newman, the meeting was very important. It was the first time that he had stood before so many experts in the fields of physics and engineering. Experts who had the capability of disproving his strange theory. But at the end of the two-hour meeting, just the opposite occurred. I asked him uh, two very distinct questions uh, toward the conclusion. I said, does anyone here disagree with what I'm saying? No one spoke up. No one disagreed. Complete and total silence. I said, uh, well, let me ask it another way. Is there anyone here who agrees with what I'm saying? And uh, surprising to me, vigorously, quite a few people spoke up and said, yeah. So once again, Joseph Newman and his theory have been put to the test. And once again, no one disproves it. Many agree with it. But no attempt is made to conduct definitive tests. That's not negative at all. In August of this year, Joseph Newman called one of the premier instrumentation firms in the world. 
He requested that engineers be sent to his home to make sure the testing equipment he had purchased from that company was working properly. On August 24th, two engineers tested the equipment and Mr. Newman's machine. Both were electrical engineers with 50 years experience between them. One had a master's degree from MIT. After testing the Newman device for five hours, one of the engineers called me. He said the machine is simply incredible. It does exactly as the inventor claims. He then offered a letter and the test results. Plus, he and his partner agreed to an interview. But the next day, company representatives called WWL to say there would be no letter, no interviews, and the company's name should not be used. Shortly thereafter, the two engineers asked us not to use their name for fear of being fired. At that point, WWL engineers agreed to duplicate the test that the two engineers had done. After a day and a half of testing, the results showed a device 820% efficient. Now to that, engineers and physicists will immediately say impossible, when in fact that figure is misleading, because this very unconventional device, powered by heretofore unknown process, is being measured by conventional instruments and equations. But nevertheless, the proof remains. According to conventional theory, it can't do what it's doing. Just sitting there continuously rotating a rotor requires more power than is going into the device. There's three, three forms of power that can come out of this device. Mechanical power, uh, electrical power, and then the power that's fed back into the batteries. So there's three separate outputs of power. And actually, we're only measuring one of these. So the actual power output of it is, is greater than what we've measured. Before testing the machine and meeting the inventor, one WWL engineer said, in effect, the whole thing was preposterous. The other said, oh no, not another perpetual motion device. But when the tests were over, no one said preposterous, no one thought perpetual motion. I'm absolutely fascinated. Uh, I have, of course, a certain amount of ambivalence, as, as most people do, who have been grounded in conventional theory, in that it looks too good to be true, yet on the other hand, his theory makes a great deal of sense. It explains things uh, in magnetic theory that were never satisfactorily explained to me by conventional theory. And if, in fact, his device does work, which I believe it does, uh, I firmly believe we stand on the threshold of something absolutely unknown in the history of humanity. During this week, we've presented scientists and engineers who have tested the machine and not only agree that the unit works, but that someday it will also power cars, planes, and ships. In short, they believe the invention of Joseph Newman could possibly change the world. When Einstein first claimed that E equals MC square, even his closest friends in the scientific community said, impossible. When Robert Goddard, the father of modern day rockets, first suggested a rocket flight to the moon, his fellow engineers and the media totally ignored him. And just this week, there was 81-year-old Barbara McClintock. She was labeled absolutely mad when she said her experiments with corn in her backyard proved that genes could travel. On Monday, 43 years after the fact, she was given a Nobel Prize for her work. This prototype is simply to prove the merit of this theory. What the theory shows is that very quickly, a very compact, small device can be made uh, and be produced for the consumer, probably within a couple year, years of a uh, time, that they could buy for a home, an automobile, or an airplane, or a space vehicle, or whatever. And once they buy that device, they'll never have to pay for energy again. If you doubt this strange story, you are not alone. One of the first to doubt was Dr. Roger Hastings, a PhD in physics from Minnesota. After conducting innumerable tests, Dr. Hastings no longer doubts. Are you not talking about a machine that would change the world? It certainly would. Do you know how crazy that's going to sound to the people watching? Well just about as crazy as it sounded to me the first time I heard it. <laughs> but uh, my point of view uh, is just that I have made measurements, I have seen enough experiments that are just not explainable on the basis of our present understanding of, my present understanding of, of uh, physics. It's something that, that would really change the world, and it's something that any conscientious person can't walk away from. When you've seen something that puts out more energy than it takes in, and you've taken some measurements that tell you that's true, if you have any conscience at all, you can't walk away from that. 
When Joseph Newman stepped before a news conference today to make his astonishing claims, sitting beside him was Dr. Hastings and representatives of the State Department of Energy, longtime skeptics, now convinced. I was not convinced probably on the first three times that I saw the device and saw it tested that, uh, that indeed it put out more energy than it, than it took in. I am convinced now. Uh, I was a little bit prejudiced and like all people that come up with uh, devices like this, you think they're wrong and so you go down to prove them wrong if you're that interested. And I was not able to prove him wrong, nor were the people that I was with able to prove him wrong. But for those of us who worry about skyrocketing utility bills and Arab oil embargoes, just imagine, what if Joe Newman is right? I think Einstein is going to have to take a second seat to Joe Newman. But acceptance has been a long time in coming. Joseph Newman's obsession began in 1967, when he began sending his 130-page thesis to every major government department in the United States. Response was either non-existent or negative for years. But in the late 1970s, that began to change. In 1976, Senator John Stennis requested funding for the project. Later, astronaut Captain Ronald Evans approved the theory and recommended it to NASA. Shortly thereafter, in 1979, Dr. Robert Smith, chief of space environments at NASA, wrote, because of your theory, Several laws of physics may need to be re-examined. And then, Dr. E.L. Moraine, one of the men involved in the making of the atomic bomb, wrote, Your project will lead to developments that would be beneficial to all mankind. So, in little less than a year, the U.S. Patent Office has told the man who just may have an amazing machine, number one, they didn't want to talk with him. Number two, they will never give him a patent. Number three, the invention has a hidden energy device. Number four, there is no hidden energy device. Your invention works, but your description of the invention is inadequate. And finally, your description is adequate. Your invention does not work. I made a vow standing on a mountain as a young man in Puerto Rico what I was going to do for humanity, and I've lived it. Um, but anyway, I got many, many books and mastered all of them. Uh, I made 11th grade reading comprehension when I was in orphanage home in the second grade. It's a gift that God's given me. And where most people don't like to read, I, I read like a sponge absorbs water at that speed. Uh, and that's why things are easy for me. I used to be on radio shows all over the nation. And they used to have me on because the people who, the power brokers had bought my book I published in 1984 because this technology was too important to be in the mind of one human being. And I published the book in case they kill me, the people would still have the technology. This is going to change the world. Now, you may not know it, but there's anywhere from, we're talking about billions of dollars, from anywhere from six to nine billion dollars on energy per year. No, I, this I will, understand. This, I... Will take, this will take 100% of that market. It will take 100% of that market. Because as soon as I started producing it and running cars, uh, ships, planes, ships, everything, spacecraft, all of it. Now, the universe is electromagnetic, uh, just like every place that they have went out in space. What, they, what do they find? An electromagnetic field. It shows you that an electromagnetic field prevails our galaxy. Well, it don't take any brains to know there ain't but one way to travel in a practical way is to use that same energy. The same energy that this technology produces. This converts mass into energy on a 100% conversion process, and there's no pollution at all to the human race. I can take salt water and convert it into fresh water, even in Phoenix. Y'all are, y'all are fighting with other states, California, Nevada, and other states, over water. Now, I can take salt water and convert it into fresh water at basically no cost. And you pump it from the Pacific Ocean. Now, they can't do it with conventional power because it costs too much. With this technology, you can, and water would not be a problem, and those states that I just quoted would not be in, in court right now fighting over water. Now, I remember when you first started doing this, there was a story of a, a young lawyer that uh, set up a one-page contract kind of deal. People are ready to sign, and all of a sudden uh, they're putting a little pressure on you, and the lawyer winds up dead. 